The Yellow Drawing Room by Mona Caird. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ginny. I approach this episode in my life, which presents itself to my memory as entitled, with dislike, mingled with fascination. I hate the whole subject, but I can't leave it alone. Those accursed three weeks, spent under the same roof with Venora Hayden, seem to have deprived me of myself, unhinged me, destroyed the balance of my character. I feel as if I might, perhaps, throw off this absurd spell by calmly smoothing out the ruffled memories and studying them scientifically. Venora's aunt, Miss Clementina Thorne, was a nice, appreciative old maiden lady, who thought me the most estimable and charming of men. I had long regarded her with warm affection, tempered only by a mild resentment at her perpetual attempts to get me married. In her pressing invitation to come once more to Fairfield, where the fresh air would be so good for me after my dusty and dingy office, I read at sight that another matrimonial scheme was fermenting in that most hymeneal brain. I knew that this time she had destined me for one of her nieces, as she mentioned that they had no visitors at present and that Venora would be at home. Though I had hovered about Clara with vague admiration for over a year, I had never yet seen Venora. Her aunt mentioned, in her much underlined epistle, that her brother-in-law, since his dear wife's death, had let the girls have too much of their own way, and that Venora, who had received permission to decorate and furnish the drawing-room at Fairfield exactly as she pleased, had unworthily employed her liberty by producing a room of brilliant yellow. I had a prejudice against Venora, and this last freak made me think none the better of her. Evidently she was rather a headstrong and probably affected young person. Everyone said that she liked to make herself conspicuous, and that you never knew what she was going to do next. I hate that sort of girl. The true woman is retiring, unobtrusive, indistinguishable even, until you come to know her well. And then she is very much like what every other true woman would be under the same conditions. I had pronounced views in these matters. As for the yellow drawing room, I was anxious to see just how far Venora's mania to be out of the common had carried her in this instance. Arrived at Fairfield, I was at once shown into the notorious drawing room. It was yellow. The color had been washed out of the very daffodils, which looked green with jealousy. The sunshine was confronted in a spirit of respectful independence, brotherhood being acknowledged, but the principle of equality uncompromisingly asserted. Miss Thorne sadly shook her head. We want my brother-in-law to have the room done over again, Mr. St. Vincent, but he won't hear of it. We did all we could with Venora. We told her that nobody used such a brilliant color. But she only said that she found nobody, when you came to talk to him seriously, was a person quite open to reason. Dear Venora is so quaint. Her taste seems to be rather quaint, I said. Several visitors were passionately admiring the prospect, the pictures, the chairs and tables, anything to protect themselves against a threatening summons to say something about the general coloring. Miss Thorne seemed to be piteously endeavoring, by her manners, her attire, her sentiments, to atone for that unpardonable drawing-room. The sisters also, Mary and Clara, were doing their best in the same direction. But hopeless was their protest. The room was in a glow of golden light. No ladylike antidote, however strong, could lead one to ignore it. It was radiant, bold, unapologetic, unabashed. It was not the room that my ideal woman would have created. My ideal woman would unfailingly choose a nice tone of gray-blue. Certain suspicions which I had harbored that Clara Hayden was my ideal woman grew stronger as I watched her quiet English face bent over the tea tray. I liked the straightforward look of the girl, her blue eyes and fair complexion. If I was to give up my liberty, the reins should be handed over to a kind, sensible young woman like Clara, who would hate to make herself remarkable or her drawing-room yellow. I think the hot afternoon sun and the unceasing sound of Aunt Clementina's voice must have made me drowsy, for I was thinking mistily what a wonderfully and conspicuously clean girl Clara Hayden was, when the door opened and I found myself floundering, 
I cannot do more than describe these dreamy impressions in an ocean of laughter. In my efforts to keep my head above water, I discovered rather sharply that I had upset my tea, which Clara's exceedingly clean fingers had just poured out for me. This brought me to my senses. I appear to be graduating for an idiot, I exclaimed, furious at my clumsiness and stupidity. Fenora laughed in a friendly manner. We have all been yearning to get rid of this cup, she said, and we really feel grateful to you for your opportune assistance. In the few bewildering moments of apology and reassurance, I found myself presented emphatically to Venora, and lightly indicated to a dark and lank young man who followed her into the room. Venora herself was simply radiant. She had a mass of glistening golden hair, a color full, varying, emotional, eyes like the sea. I lose my temper when people ask me to describe their color. In figure she was robust, erect, pliant, firmly knit. Though her movements were so swift, there was nothing restless about her. A ground tone of repose sounded up through the surface scintillations. She was vital, not galvanic. That was the revealing word, vital. In the human color spectrum, she took the place of the yellow ray. This was all out of keeping. According to my doctrines, it was even impossible. Women ought to take the place of the blue or violet rays. In my scheme of the universe, they always did so, except in the case of a distinctly unwomanly woman. But this, in spite of offending against every canon I had ever set up, Venora certainly was not. She was supremely, overpoweringly womanly. The womanhood of her sisters paled before the exuberant feminine quality which I could not but acknowledge in Venora. Everything was wrong and contradictory. I seemed to be taking part in some comedy of errors, wherein Venora played Columbine and I, the part of fool, I began grimly to suspect. For already, I shrugged my shoulders at myself in contemptuous despair, I found that I hated the lank young man who had been introduced as Mr. George Inglis, simply and solely because I saw that he was head over ears in love with Venora, and that she treated him with a sort of indescribable good fellowship, mingled with a peculiar tenderness. I never saw anything to equal Venora's tenderness when she was moved that way. I hear, Miss Venora, I said, that the credit of this room is entirely yours. The lank admirer looked around. Venora glanced at me alertly. You have every reason to be proud, I continued, determined not to spare her. You must have surprised more people than you could easily count, though I have no wish to impugn your arithmetic. They will all be grateful to you for a new sensation. Forgive me for disagreeing with you, she said. It is so easy to surprise people. They are so amiable. They keep themselves always prepared for astonishment. They are like a sensitized plate which is ready at a moment's notice to be surprised into a photograph. You come with your dogma, or your self-evident fact, or simply your pot of yellow paint, and behold, forth springs the various amazements. Oh, no, thanking you all the same. I am not proud. I raised my eyebrows witheringly. My ideal woman would consider it almost indelicate to play with words in this fantastic fashion. I glanced at my gray-blue goddess. How comfortably certain one felt with her of enjoying conversational repose. Dear Clara, with what admirable good taste she carried out one's cherished ideas. She fitted them like a glove. I completely, ardently approved of Clara. To her I rather ostentatiously devoted myself for the rest of the afternoon but I was furtively watching her sister. And now I come to the disagreeable and inexplicable part of my broken and absurd episode. I know not to this day why or wherefore, but Fenora began to exercise over me an extraordinary fascination. If there were any other word, I would use it, but I cannot find one. I fell into the strangest and most contradictory state of mind. Fenora's personality seemed to enwrap me as a garment, she was like some great radiating center of light and warmth. I was penetrated with the glowing atmosphere. I never approved of the girl. I don't believe that I then liked her. I know that I often hated her, and yet I felt miserable out of her sight. She became a necessity to me. A feeling of misery, which I cannot describe, assailed me in her absence. A sick feeling of senseless despair. I used to pace the terrace among the peacocks. 
the boys impertinently insisted that they were unable on such occasions to distinguish me from those conceited birds. And as I thus worked off some of my restlessness, I tried to understand what had happened to me. One morning after breakfast, Venora came out onto the terrace. She walked straight up to me and said, Good morning. I think you want to talk to me, don't you? I looked at her in despair. If she lived and improved for a thousand years, she would never be an ideal woman. You disapprove of me, Venora continued calmly. I wish you would tell me why. You really wish me to be frank, I said, stopping and facing her. I really do, she replied, offering crumbs of bread to a haughty peacock, who eyed them superciliously. Well then, Miss Hayden, your blood be upon your own head. Beautiful was that golden head in the morning light. You seem to me to have many qualities and ideas that are not suited to your sex. No doubt I am old-fashioned about these things, but I confess that I cannot rejoice when I see our beautiful ideals of womanhood set scornfully at naught. No, said Venora, do go on. I scarcely know how to approach a subject of which you do not seem to understand the rudiments, I said severely. This interests me, cried Venora. I particularly desire to be awakened on this drowsy side of me. I can't bear to be blind and stupid. I want very much to be shown at least the gates of realms that are forbidden to me. The sacred realms where woman is queen will soon be forbidden to you if you consistently continue to think and act in disharmony with the feminine nature and genius. That is what Aunt Clementina and Mr. Barnes so often tell me. Mr. Barnes is our clergyman. But at present the threat of being excluded from the realms you mention does not terrify me. I rather prefer the realms where woman is not queen. A mistake, a mistake, I exclaimed. Yes, so I am told, but often people don't know what is good for them. I have heard of persons of mature judgment who had a chance of going straight off to heaven to play on golden harps and wear a halo, hanging back and sending for the doctor in a strongly ill-advised manner. Of course, we shall all have to go to the realms where woman is queen, but for myself I confess to a weak inclination to postpone, or let us say, not to anticipate my royalty. The suspicion is clearly blamable, but what if I should happen to get tired of the everlasting harping? Venora's face was perfectly serious. Miss Hayden, I said, gravely and sadly, you may have a brilliant career in the future, but the more brilliant, the more complete will be your failure, the more I shall mourn the loss of a real woman from the spheres where she was intended to create and to maintain those sacred ties and sentiments without which this world would be a howling wilderness. Venora tossed another crumb to the supercilious peacock. Do go on, she repeated. If women only realized where their true power lay, and how mighty was that power, they would never seek to snatch it in directions where they are inevitably weak and, if I must say it, inevitably ridiculous. I was born to be ridiculous, said Venora. My father never sought to arrange a sphere for me, and in my case instinct seems at fault. At one time I used to make a credible number of antimacassars and sofa cushions, and to this day my sisters do all that can possibly be required of a well-conducted family. And what is especially satisfactory from a popular point of view, they think a baby far more interesting than a grown-up creature with a soul, or even than a child who can think and feel. They are keeping up the feminine traditions admirably. Don't you think it would be a little monotonous if I were to go over exactly the same ground? It seems to me that that ground is getting rather trodden in. I am sorry to hear you sneer at your good and charming sisters, and at the true instincts of your sex. Venora burst out laughing. Oh, Mr. St. Vincent, you really are a little stupid sometimes, she said. She turned, and I saw a change come into her face as George Inglis appeared from the wood at the far end of the terrace and walked towards us. That filled me with unaccountable fury. My critical mood, which I had maintained with no little difficulty, fell off me, and I was swaying as a wind-tossed reed with strange, uncontrollable emotion. You don't know what it has cost me to speak to you thus, I said, catching her hand. You interest me. You, yes, I must say it, you fascinate me, and it distresses me, maddens me to feel myself led away by qualities which ought to repel me. The attraction is morbid, unwholesome. I am angry with myself for even feeling it. Venora, you must release me. 
Release you, she repeated. What do you mean? I mean, I replied crazily, that you must learn to love me and to be a woman in the old sweet sense, for my sake. You are very naive, she said, smiling. You seem just now to me like a nice, egotistical child. I turned abruptly away. I knew that George Inglis joined her and that they walked down the terrace together. I suppose I must have been in love with her, yet all the time I seemed to hate her. I longed to make her yield to me, to love me with a lowly, uplooking love. I had a burning desire to subdue her. She seemed to evade me and my theories, as if she were a creature from another sphere. I cannot describe the irritation of mind which all this caused me. I set about my wooing as if I had been going to fight a duel. Shortly after this, to my intense disgust, I found that George Inglis had discovered my accursed secret. I chanced to overhear him saying to Miss Thorne, The contest is a typical one. If one could imagine the 18th century as a lover wooing the 19th century, this is the sort of angular, labyrinthian courtship we should have. I wondered what the chattering fool meant by it. She shall love me, and she shall learn, through love, the sweet lesson of womanly submission, I said to myself, all the dominating instincts of my manhood roused into activity by this hateful experience. I felt that she was utterly wrong, that she had mistaken her own powers and her own noblest impulses. It was for me, through the might of an overwhelming affection, to set alight the true womanly flame within her heart. I would make her proud of her subordination. I would turn the splendid stream of her powers and affection into the true channel. After a day or two of lover-like devotion, I began to slacken in my pursuit and to transfer my attentions to Clara. Clara became a new creature. Her expression softened, her eyes brightened, but I was too absorbed in my own little drama to consider what part Clara might be likely to play in it. I watched Venora secretly. She seemed depressed and restless. My heart bounded. Venora was jealous, a woman after the old eternal pattern, therefore to be won. Dear, erratic, foolish, brilliant Venora, you shall be brought back safe and sound to your true destiny. I followed her to the garden, whither I knew she had gone to gather flowers. Very lovely she looked in her white dress, with a bunch of daffodils in her belt. I plunged headlong. Venora, I love you. I want to know my fate. Me? she said with a gasp of astonishment. I thought it was Clara. I clasped her hands. I protested. I told her how my love for her had overwhelmed and shattered me. And Clara? she repeated in dismay. Did she not understand? It was out of pique to make her jealous. When I become jealous of my sisters, said Venora, with a quiet and scornful aloofness, you can come and preach me your doctrines. I shall understand them then. But Nora, at present they seem to me like soap bubbles, full of emptiness. But you don't understand. True, she returned. They have never before assailed me in this stiff-backed fashion. I offend against them unconsciously. My father never constrained me to move in any particular direction because of my sex. He has perhaps spoiled me. I have hitherto had only a joyous sense of drawing in what was outside and radiating out what was within me. When you describe your doctrines, I seem to see the doors of a dark prison opening out of the sunshine, and, strange to say, I feel no divine, unerring instinct prompting me to walk in. I offer you no prison but a home, I cried excitedly. You would turn all homes into prisons, she returned. Prisons whose bars are the golden bars of love and duty. Yes, you take a woman's love and duty and fashion out of them her prison bars. Is that generous? I fancy not, but it is most ingenious. It is loyal-esque, but I don't like even golden bars, Mr. St. Vincent. You have evidently not a spark of love for me, I cried distractedly. Her face suddenly changed. Ah, that is the horrible absurdity of it, she exclaimed, coloring painfully. You enthrall one part of me and leave the other scornful and indifferent. We have scarcely a thought in common, but I am miserable when you are absent. Stop. Don't misunderstand. Your gods and goddesses are to me creatures of pasteboard. Your world of belief seems to me like a realm fashioned out of tissue paper. She spoke with breathless rapidity, and she was quivering from head to foot. To live with you would be like living in a tomb. I lack the sense of fresh air, 
and there is no sunshine within miles of you. Yet, when I am not with you, there is a sort of ache. Your personality seems to fascinate me. I wish to heaven you had never come here. You have disturbed my happiness, destroyed my delight in life, left me miserably dependent on you, yet to the end of time I should continue to shock and irritate you, and you would stifle, depress, and perhaps utterly unhinge me. I wish you would go, today, now. She looked white and distraught. I pleaded like a lunatic, argued, urged. For one supreme moment my arms were round her, and I thought that she would yield, but whether or not a triumph was in store for me I shall never know, for suddenly we both started in dismay. Before us, pausing abruptly as she came round the bend of the laurel shrubberies, stood Clara. I shall never forget the look on her face at that moment. It was like that of some gentle animal mortally and wantonly wounded. Without a word, Clara turned away, and Venora and I stood in silence. At last, slowly moving away, Venora spoke. I can forgive you the injury you have done to me, that you could not help, and the fault, after all, is my own, but I can never forgive what you have done to Clara. She passed out of sight, and I stood spellbound. I never saw Venora again. I left Fairfield immediately, and I heard that she and her sister had gone abroad. I could not find out where they were, nor had I the temerity to think of following them. I knew that fate had no reprieve for me. The episode remains in my mind as a haunting, incomprehensible dream. Ponder as I may, I cannot understand what impulses of our nature Venora and I had power mutually to set at variance, what irresistible attraction we had for one another combined with what inevitable antipathy. We could never have lived together. I see that now. Yet when the memory of those ten days returns to torment me, I feel that neither can we live apart. I have never been the same man since I met Venora. I am neither my former self, complete and comfortable, nor am I thoroughly a new being. I am a sort of abortive creature, striding between two centuries. The spirit of a coming age has brushed me with his wing, but I resent and resist that which brings havoc into the citadel of my dearest beliefs, and I angrily pluck off the tiny feather which he dropped from those great plowing pinions of his, that shadow, the firmament of the future. End of the Yellow Drawing Room by Mona Caird